of course, <laughs> it won't play any music. But that's okay, we're still here. Hold on, here it goes, all right. Whew. All right, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. It is Thursday night. Let me scoogle closer so I can see. Anna gets our award for the first viewer tonight, followed closely by Jonathan. And then Ian. And our guest is already here. Great, wonderful. Welcome to the Jason Elliott Show. Sorry about that weird beginning. I just updated my iPad and stuff is where I've never seen it before and is doing things I've never done before. It's all crazy stuff, but it's all right because here we are. And I'm so excited to have you here tonight on the Jason Elliott Show. STI Awareness Month is continuing tonight. Last week, we, well, the week before last, we talked to Caitlin about herpes, and tonight I'm really excited to talk about another H in the STI world, HIV. So we have Chris, who's going to be joining us momentarily, um, and I am glad that you've joined us too. I'm going to ask you the same five questions I ask you every single week. After I turn that down, so I don't have to yell at you. You never answer, but I always ask. One day you'll catch on. But these are the things I want to know. First of all, who are you? Where are you watching from? What's the weather like where you are? How's your mama? And what are you doing to be 51%? While you type out your answers, I want you to click on the bottom. There's a share button. Just click share. Because this is a really awesome conversation we're going to have tonight. All about sexual health, about HIV, about being empowered as someone who is living with HIV. Um, so if you are excited to hear about it, I want you to click share for me. And in the meantime, let me know how you're doing. Because everybody's quiet tonight. Everybody is really quiet. And that's okay. For now. But uh, Chris has already said he is ready and excited to answer any questions that you have tonight. Um, and I'm also here to answer any questions too. Uh, so, with that, I'm just going to pop over, get myself something to drink. And um, I'll be right back. Oh, yes. There better be some comments on there by the time I get back. It was a fast one tonight, because I already had this ready to go. Jonathan said he's doing great. Hey, Ray, thanks for being here. Rachel, great to see you. Uh, let's see, Todd says, <laughs> Mama is stressed. Why is Mama stressed? Talk to me about your stress. I can understand that, but I want to know what's going on. Let's see, the lovely one and only Sasha Adam Sanchez says, I'm in D.C., it's cold. I'm in bed. I'm hungry. and don't want to pack. That sounds like me at any given point in time. I always say I'm hungry. I'd rather be in bed. I never want to pack. I get it. That's all right. It's worth it. It'll totally be worth it. She's jet setting all over the country to entertain people and have a good time. Uh, let's see. Rachel says, hey doll. Glad you're doing well. I am. At least I try. And I hope the same is true for you. I'm going to pull this up over here. Hi, Henry. Thank you for being here. All right, everybody. Let's see. I've got this pulled up right over here. I want you to do me a favor and just click the share button if you don't mind. So we can bring some more people into this conversation. Uh, and let's see. Hey, Todd. Thank you for being here. Todd says, uh, this is Todd Ayer. I'm in Melbourne, Florida. It's cold. Oh, no, it's not cold. I was reading the next comment. It's beautiful at the beach, and my mama is stressed. That's what you were trying to say. Um, well, I am jealous that you're at the beach because all the rest of us up here are a little bit chilly. Um, let's see. Miss Smart is here. Marcus is here. A couple other people are here. Oh, and Todd said his, his kitty cat's dealing with some issues. Well, I am so sorry to hear that, but... I am sure that things will go well. All right, let's see. Do me a favor. Um, Chris, if you are here, can you do me a favor and just type that you're here so I know that you are. 
And if I am inviting, uh, inviting you via the ISIS page, if you can just comment and let me know that so I know that I'm sending the invite to the right profile, that would be so kind of you. All right. Hi, Sheldon. Thanks for being here. Tammy watching all the way from Michigan tonight. Thank you for being here. Ralph is here. Awesome, Ralph. Thank you for being here. Ben Fulcher has just tuned in. Hello. And let's see here. Isis says here. So I am guessing. Yep. All right. So we're on Isis. So we're going to bring on our special guest here. Perhaps. Give me one second. Here, you can just turn your phone landscape wise. There he is. Hello. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Let's fix this angle. <laughs> I said, well, that's an interesting angle for tonight. You might get tired. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, right. Well, hello, everybody. This is Chris uh, through the wonderful page of Isis. Um, I didn't know which one you would be on tonight, so yeah. thanks for... I thought I was on Chris, but then I realized my phone was set to Isis, so... <laughs> That's okay, because regardless of, of which persona, we love you anyway. Um, so, and I'm just going to turn this up just a little bit so I can hear your wonderful voice and your wonderful story. So, ladies and gents and everybody here, um, I, I want to welcome to the Jason Elliott Show. This is Chris um, from the D.C. area. Um, and if you see it tagged as ISIS, that's because Chris also moonlights as a wonderful entertainer. Um, so, yeah, so Chris is actually here. I'm not going to steal much of his thunder, um, but when I talked about uh, a while back on a post and said, hey, I want to talk about um, STIs, and I want to talk about what it's like to receive a positive lab report, um, Chris was actually one, you, you may not know this, but you were one of the first people to say, you know what, um, I think the story needs to be told. And um, you, you actually sent a message that said, I get people are embarrassed about it, but being embarrassed and being ashamed are two different things. So I'm super excited to have you here tonight. <laughs> um, and I want to say right off the bat that um, Chris has said that he is an open book and that he is here willing and ready to answer any questions that you had. So Todd, yes, you can absolutely comment on this topic. Um, and anybody else, feel free to ask questions as we go along, um, because that's exactly what we're here to do. We're here to talk about a journey and to share it with each other and hopefully learn from it. So feel free, everyone, to comment your questions, and I'll relay them to Chris in case you can't see them. Um, Sandra is watching, Brad, Sarah, Crystal, a bunch of people. <laughs> uh, so I'm really excited they're all here, and we'll give shout-outs as the, the night comes. Uh, but without further ado... Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. So we know what you're going to talk to us about later on, um, but kind of to get us to know you a little bit. Who are you? Where, where are you living at? What you do for a living? What you like to do? Tell us a little bit about you. Um, uh, my name is Chris. I am 34. I live in D.C. Um, I'm a medical assistant, but I also um, do um, patient care coordinating for a wonderful company in Northern Virginia. We have multiple clinics throughout Northern Virginia, Maryland, and a few in DC. And I do a lot of outreach with uh, patients um, just on general health, and a lot of it is STI, STD, so related. Awesome. Um, I used to do drag for fun. Um, I put that aside to work on my career. And right now I just hang out with friends, I play in um, kickball in the city. It's called Stonewall Kickball, so if anyone's interested, look into your local area and you can play. So, I love that nice little plug right there. Yeah. We don't have Stonewall here in Charlottesville, but I've seriously considered driving either to D.C. or to Richmond. Richmond has it. Richmond just started it, so yeah. I know. I know a couple people who are playing, and I'm like, hmm. That's, it's oddly like addicting. It. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, all right. So, jumping right into it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and I, I would just throw it out there um, that... I think that it's awesome that you are so um, open about your story. So I, I know your story from kind of knowing you personally uh, for some time, but share with us, if you don't mind, um, how you got to this point where you're here on the show talking about um, a certain diagnosis. Okay, so a um, little backstory for me. Um, I was already aware of HIV and everything, obviously being a gay man. Um, my mom had HIV. She died from complications of it um, back in 2001, or 2002, excuse me. Um, but in June of 23rd, on, <laughs> it was a Sunday of 2013, um, those little STI, uh, HIV vans that come around through DC, they come and they give you $35 to get your testing. And I was broke, and I was just starting medical assistant school, and I was like, I could use $35? Shit. <laughs> um, so I went in the van, and they, I thought nothing of it. Went into the van, and they did an oral swab, and I, I was sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, getting anxious, knowing that I left, you know, left the bar, because I was actually working that night at the bar, and... They waited and waited and waited, and she came back and she told me I was positive that you need to go to your nearest clinic to get tested to confirm. But the oral swab came back positive. So for me, it was, I was devastated. I was, the initial devastation was horrible for me. Um, I can still, like, I still get a little anxious about it, but, um, I've never really talked about it publicly this this public before. So um yeah, um I got off the bus, the little van, and one of my best friends, my current but one of my current best friends, um, Graham was working at the bar with me. He re he knew instantly what was wrong because I was just like dead dead face, just like I was I was mortified. And he came and grabbed me and hugged me and I cried. Because, you know, it was still very emotional. Still is emotional for me. Um, but, you know, it was, it was, it was a long night. <laughs> it was a long night. Um, Sasha, was at, Sasha got called in. She actually was on the feed. Sasha, Christina Kelly. Like, it was a, it was a big thing. <laughs> but, I mean, five years now, five years later, I'm comfortable with who I am. I'm happy. I'm healthy. I have no complaints. I'm still lo I'm loving life. I've learned to love life again. And that's the most important thing to know, is that life goes on. And, I've, you know, it's not a death sentence anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you, you said that you knew, like, you knew about HIV. You knew what it was. Um, when you, you, when you went into that, you were one person and when you came out i think maybe you were another person but you were still you so can you talk about because i i have always known you to be very sure of who you are um so can you talk about was there a point when you felt like maybe your identity had changed um or or where you as a person changed because of that diagnosis um, the first couple of weeks were extremely hard for me. Um, guilt, you feel so many emotions when you first find out because you just are overwhelmed. You know, you, you have guilt, you feel like, you feel disgusting. You feel like the stigma really just gets you the first couple of weeks because, you know, people joke around all the time, but like the stigma is still there and it's really strong. And people can be hurtful. Um, but, you know, the first two, first couple of weeks, it was, I stayed, I, the sad part was the next day, that Monday, I started my medical assistant school. So, like, I didn't have a lot of time to, like, focus on it. I had to go start my day. 
So like I went to school, I was I had that in the background. I started the day and like I would just come home, do homework and stay in my room. Uh, I, I you know I was living with some of my be- um, one of my best friends Sebastian at the time. I would, didn't even want to talk to him. I would just come home and cry. You know, I felt like I let my mom down. You know, because she passed away from it. Like I, I you know so it was like just really hard to like figure out who I was, what I was gonna do. Like it was, it was probably the scariest thing I've ever experienced in my life, um, because I didn't have my mom there. I didn't have family to like, be like, hey, it's gonna be okay. I had friends, but like, they don't, they they don't understand because they don't. They're not positive. They can empathize, but they, you know, they don't know what I'm going. They didn't know what I was going through. I didn't know, and yet at the time, any people who are HIV positive, that were open about it. So, like, I was right. very, like, what do I do? Like, who do I go to? Who do I talk to? Like, who can, who's going to relate to me? And how do I open up to people? And are they going to treat me different? So that was, like, the biggest, the biggest hurdle. But, uh, you know, I I faced a, a lot of people with opinions. Um, there were people with opinions. I'm not, I'm not going to make this, like, it was a, wonderful story like everyone was so acceptive a lot of people were acceptive a lot of people were very friendly and very understanding and very comforting but there were a couple people that said okay no problem and then I never heard from them again so and my I mean if I didn't have a support group if I didn't have you know all these people supporting me I probably would have still been lost and like trying to figure out who I'm what I was going to do it was a very, 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 very uh, weird path to go down by yourself. So, yeah, when I, I want to talk about that support group for just a couple of minutes, and and I think some of the people watching might be able to speak to this. Um, so, first of all, I will say that you're getting all kinds of love in these comments. Uh-huh. I don't know if you can see the comments. Um, Justin, we all love and know Justin. Uh, love you, Chris, and you're amazing. Jonathan says, we appreciate you, Chris. Tammy says, you're beautiful and amazing. <laughs> Jeremiah says, love you, Isis. Um, and so a lot of people are sending that love oh, now. Thank you. I, I want to talk about what, what that love being sent then empowered you to do. Um, so Todd, Todd is commenting and saying he's um, undetectable. He's been paused since like 2009, 2010 time frame. So, um, and Todd, Feel free to, to talk about your support groups too. Um, but Chris, what, cause you, I, I can't imagine not having my family with me when I go through trying times because my family is so important. And we talk about blood family versus chosen family. Um, but you were just talking about how that support group meant so much to you. So can you tell us like, I think for a lot of people, they say, holy crap, I have no idea how to support somebody. You know, I'm not positive or, you know, I've never been diagnosed with anything before. So for people who don't know what it's like, what, what worked for you? What did your friends do? What did they not do that, that empowered you to, to keep going? I think the, the most important, the, the, I think none of my. I think it was a learning experience for all of us. Um, that yeah. they they never had to experience this with somebody, so like they were learning how to do with it. But I, all my friends were just very very supportive in the sense like they didn't know what to say except "I love you" and you'll get through it. And you're the same Chris that you were three days ago. You know, you were the same person that you were. And they just kept on telling me that and telling me that. And I'm just like, okay, I can get through this. I can get through this. I can do this. I can do this. Um, and I think that was, I think that also, like, that's a bond that I've, I'll share with my friends that I'll, like, certain friends that I have that I will never, ever forget. Yeah. Now, were there times when they were saying, we love you, we love you, you can do this, and you're the same, Chris? Were there times when maybe you didn't feel like they loved you or that you were the same Chris or that you could actually do it? Um, I struggled with being ISIS. Mm-hmm. 
because Isis is this big empowered drag queen who just has this big voice, who always likes to have fun and laugh and and be this star and be this bright energy. And, you know, sometimes she can be a catty little witch sometimes. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, she was this, she was this, she was this outlet for people like who made other people feel good. And I really thought for a second that I would, how can I make other people feel good if I can't feel good myself? Yeah. So like, it was very like, okay, do I really have this? Can do it? Do I really, do I really have what it takes to the, and then what happens if, okay, if my first initial thought was, well, I don't have to tell anybody. So I won't tell anybody. I just won't talk about it. And then when I don't talk about it, no one's going to know. And if no one knows, no one can judge me. So that that was for the first couple of years was I just didn't talk about it. I didn't say anything. I went back to living my life, doing what I wanted to do, going back and like being very supportive, you know, in the drag community, doing drag. And then, like, it was always eating away at me. Like, it's always this, like, thing that, like, people just, do they know? Like, every time someone looks at you, do they know, like, what's going on? Like, are they talking about you? And it eats away at you, like, especially in our community. Because yeah, despite anything, our community, can, as, as loving and supportive as our community likes to be, they're just as equally as mean and cool, and they can be very hurtful. So... How do you, even now, how do you deal with those cruel and hurtful people or comments? Because, I mean, we're not sugarcoating anything. They exist, and there are people that are ignorant and rude, and they are malicious. So how how do you deal with that? Is it a daily struggle for you, or does it just randomly come up? Um, It's not a daily struggle for me. Um, When I'm... No one's ever. I've had a couple of instances where people have made comments um, that were just derogatory, like, and it wasn't towards me. It was towards other people. I'll hear other people say things like, oh, and and they they think it's funny at the time, but it's not. I've heard people say, you know, oh, I hope he gets just, I hope he gets AIDS and dies. Like that's just not something to joke about, regardless. And you know, um, or people will be like, oh, he. He goes out and parties so much. He's gonna get AIDS and he's gonna get sick, but that's what he gets. Like, just you know, people, people don't realize that that is hurtful. And like, you sh- you shouldn't wish that on anyone. You shouldn't wish sickness or ill will on anyone, no matter how much you dislike them or you know discord you have between them. You know, th- that's just really tacky and not like to do. Definitely. Um, for me, like I. J- I just, you know, when, anytime I hear it, I address it. I have this real, I have this, my biggest pet peeve is when I hear people come out and like, oh, I got tested today and I'm clean. My status has nothing to do with my personal hygiene. Amen. And it doesn't have <laughs> anything to do with anyone's personal hygiene. You can have a clean bill of health and still have a funky butt. You get, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't matter. Your your hygiene has nothing to do with your cleanliness. And I think people people make the mis- people don't realize how much it hurts, especially if someone hasn't indulged their status to you because you don't know who's positive and who's not. And when right. you say those type of things, people don't. And I mean, I'm guilty of saying it before I was positive. I used to, you know, before, and before I got into the medical field, I'd be like, oh, I got tested, I'm clean. Uh-huh. And I never thought about how it would feel to someone around me. And now that I am positive and I do hear people say it, I'm like, guys, you know, I mean, I've had debates on Facebook. I mean, I've straight up told people, like, look, your hygiene does not have anything to do with that. Like, you don't need to say that. <laughs> like, right. I've addressed drag queens for saying it on the microphone. Like, I'll stop a show for it. Like, you don't do that and I think that's something that we're just learning it's all about it's what I mean it's all about being respectful to each other yeah definitely yeah. and and that is I'm so glad you brought that up because that's always something I try to remind people and you know if if someone comes up to me and, and they say something like 
oh yeah, okay, so I'm clean. You know, I, I'm giving them the results of a test and you know, I might say, I don't know, did you take a bath today? You know, and, and I try to, try to just do it that way. So I, I think there's, there's a, a good way to remind people and I would like to take a moment right now to remind people exactly what Chris just said. Um, if you test negative on your next STI panel, um, that does not mean that you are clean. If you test positive for something, it does not mean that you are dirty. That simply means that you have tested negative or that you have tested positive. Um, so please remember next time that you try to describe yourself as being healthier or negative in your lab reports, um, do not use the word clean to describe yourself um, because it, it, it is hurtful and it stigmatizes these infections and these diagnoses even more. So please try to remember not to use clean. Yeah. Uh, so I want to, I want to just run through a couple of these. Uh, first of all, Justin has a really good point. This is when you were talking about all the characteristics of ISIS. And he said, Chris Huskins has every characteristic of ISIS. Um, so I think it's really important to remember that, Chris. Um, so let me see. Charlie says, love you, Chris. You were such an inspirational person to work with. Um, you are so dedicated to everything in your life, and I appreciate you so much. Uh -huh. um, Rob says, you got this, Chris. Keenan says, love you. Um, Todd says, lots of us are paused more than you know. Maybe it's different in the circuit scene. So that brings up a question. Have you found that there are certain groups or certain populations who are more or less accepting um, of you being someone living with HIV? Um, I tend to find, and it's going to sound so much crazy, it's going to sound crazy, especially in a bigger city like D.C., um, I would say people of color tend to be a little bit more understanding, especially in the gay community. Um, in the gay community, people of color, like gay people, queer, gay, queer people of color are way more understanding opposed to some white, like non, non people of color. I, I'm trying to say this correctly so I don't like piss off the whole world. <laughs> um, because I mean, there's still like, there's still like so many beyond being HIV positive in the community, like, if you don't look a certain way, you know, if you're not blonde hair, blue eyes, abs, and you look a certain way, you know, a lot of people do disregard you. not making fun of you, Jason, because you are blonde hair, blue eyes. <laughs> Let me put my hair back real quick. Let me close like, my eyes. No, but, like, in, in this community, like, a lot of people, if you don't look a certain way, they, they pay you no mind, or they, they kind of fetishize, fetishize you for your skin color sure. thing. So, you know, for this, it's very much, you know, I've told different people of different colors, <laughs> different races. I've told a bunch of my friends um, that I'm HIV positive. And it's, they've all been very welcoming and very, very supportive of me. So, you know, um, I just, I, up here for me, it's been an equal around, I'm on the board, but um, I tend to be a little hesitant to, tell certain groups of friends. I mean, not that everyone's not going to watch this video and see now, but they will you tell them now. Tell the world now. So, um, oh, well, and if they don't like it, they can kick rocks. Um, but yeah, I just, people tend to be judgy and it gets scary sometimes because you, you don't know what, how people are going to react. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. And, um, and while, while we're talking about scary, um, a couple of people have brought up this point that I want to talk to you about because you've actually been a huge resource when I've had friends and, um, you know, different connections up in your neck of the woods to, to give them this encouragement and the resources that they need for their health. So um, Todd actually commented a couple of minutes ago, said, I think the most important thing is that people realize it is no longer a death sentence. And then they realize that you can keep on living, um, and it's about living with HIV, not dying with HIV. Absolutely. And on that same note, um, Nina Bunting is watching tonight and said that my son TJ, aka Gigi, was HIV positive and very open about it. He was detected early, 
and put on meds and got to the point of being non-detectable. When he was first told, he thought it was a death sentence, but then he started to educate himself. Um, and I think that that is such an important thing to talk about because one, one of the, the first questions, I make it no secret that, you know, for now almost a decade, I've been working in the HIV and sexual health fields and out of the hundreds and possibly even thousands of tests that I've done, anytime someone is positive, the first two questions are, how am I going to pay for this? But more importantly, how long do I have to live? Um, so I am really happy to say that we have come so far that you can live with HIV. Um, we started this, you know, this, um, arena of health when people were dying of AIDS and we've come really far that now people, they are not necessarily dying of AIDS as much as they are living with HIV. So when you were told that you were positive, especially given your history with your mom, did you have that fear that this was going to kill you? Sadly, yes. That was my, even though I knew my mom lived a long time and she got it back in the 80, like early 80s. Um, she contracted it back in the early 80s um, through a blood transfusion. So like, I know with, with the proper medical health care, you can live for a full healthy life. But it's always that that initial like, is this going to is this going to kill me? Am I going to die? And my initial thought was, I saw my mom die from complications of it, so I immediately thought that was going to be me. I was like, yeah. I'm going to die, and I don't want to put. And it wasn't that I was going to die because dying is not a fear of mine. I don't want to put anyone through that. I don't want some. I don't want my friends to have to like worry about me and see me in that situation because i yeah. know my friends they would be like they'd want to be by my side and do the whole thing so like yeah it's just a scary thought like that yes um Go yeah so uh yeah it was just um i mean you get scared but after i think the most important thing is educating yourself because once you get yeah. educated and like once i went through school i got i had to go to school the next day and I went to school and I started working in the clinics and I, um, I really educated myself on it even further more than I already knew and I you know I, right. took, I took care of myself I went, I went to the doctors and you know um, I'm, luck I'm lucky enough to be a, what they call an elite progressor um, so I don't take medications I stay in that undetectable range a little I, I can bounce out a little bit out of the undetectable and back in the undetectable. Um, and my CD4 count never gets lower than 1300. Um, and that's been that way for, you know, five years. And I'm lucky enough to be one of those people. Not everyone is as yeah. fortunate. And, um, right. but you know, I, I, I've di we've diagnosed many people at my clinics with HIV and I've helped support them as well. Um, and let them know it's not, a death sentence. Yeah. So um, kind of stepping into that a little bit, a lot of people always ask me when they find out that, that I've worked as a, a tester and a counselor and educator, um, you know, what it's like to tell someone that they have HIV. Um, and, and I always say it's as unique as the person. Um, you know, and so I think that's really important to remember too, that while we're talking about all of this is, you know, we're talking about these, you know, I think amazing people who are living with HIV and, and kind of dispelling all the myths that it's just going to kill you. Um, it is really important to remember that every story is unique. And so, you know, while, while we're listening to Chris and while we're talking about this, um, you know, if anybody's had a different experience, please comment. Definitely Absolutely. You know, share too. Um, and I think that's what makes it so inspiring to me is that there are so many different people who have different levels of education, different levels of experience, different levels of, you know, behaviors, different levels of, you know, support, different levels of everything. And yet so many people are diagnosed and live. Yeah. Um, that was something Nina just said, TJ lived, believe me. Um, so I want to talk about living 
first in the literal sense. Um, so I know you have a, a, a knowledge of this. Um, and so I was hoping we might be able to talk for a couple of minutes about what it looks like to physically live um, with this virus. And you've talked about, you know, your status of uh, being an elite progressor. Um, so can you talk about physically what changes or what challenges you've seen now living with the virus? Um, for me, uh, at first, when I first found out, it was immediately I wanted to be on medication. Um, so, you know, I went, I was like, I want to be on medication because I, I don't want to die. I don't want to get sick. I don't want anything. Um, but unfortunately for me, my body reacted adversely to everything. Um, I think the only medication I was able to tolerate was Stribal, but it would it would tear my kidney. It tear. It tore my kidneys up so bad that it put me in the hospital. Um, and that was the first visit to the hospital that, like, I that was my first time ever going into the hospital for emergency room. And I thought I was like, I literally thought I was going to die because of that. It was probably one of the scariest moments um, after finding out I was HIV positive. Um, um, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know. What I thought I in my mind I thought it was HIV. I, I just thought all the negative thoughts because it happened in the first two weeks. But, um, you know, living with it, it, it's just like any other day for me. I wake up, I look, I brush my teeth, I look in the mirror, I wash my face, I think, damn, I have to go to work again. I didn't win the lottery last <laughs> night. You know, I, I, I got to go to work, so I go to work. I, I, I love doing what I do. Um, I go to work, I talk to my friends. It's like any other day for me. Um, uh -huh. I just, you know, I, I just make sure I go in every every six months to make sure I get my blood work done and make sure everything's still going well. Because, you know, at any point, I'm getting older. I'm 34 now. You know, sure. at, at any point, things could change. And I, and I have to be prepared for that. You know, it's just being aware of what could happen if I don't take care of myself. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, no, that's okay. No, I was just gonna. So uh, Todd was throwing in uh, some some good information too. Um, he said it's scary, of course, but we'll survive this as much as we have survived so much. Um, and he says that he was probably paused for about two years and was very sick, but he bounced back to undetectable, so awesome. it can be overcome. And I think that's a really important point to bring up: is that you know a lot of times we get this this thing in our head that every person is going to have like this crazy um, seroconversion story. Um, and, and basically what that means is seroconversion is pretty much your body realizing that it's positive um, and the process of basically going from HIV negative to HIV positive biologically. No. Um, so that's the process by which your body starts to react. So a lot of times people say, oh, yeah, I know you're going to have like this really bad flu or you're going to have night sweats. Or you're going to have yeah. this or you're going to have that. And lot, did, did you have any of that? Um, when I was on taking the medications, when they first gave me the medications, I was getting the I was I would get the nausea, the GI issues, like the stomach cramps, the constipation and we turn from constipation to the runs, like the, the nausea. I was just like, what is going on? This is tearing me up. I was like, yeah. is this what it's going to be like for the rest of my life? Like, you know, that's, you know, <laughs> that's your first thing you think about. It's like, I'm going to have more, I'm going to feel like a pregnant woman every morning because <laughs> I have the nausea, the stomach cramps. I'm like, Ugh. but um, yeah, eventually those, those symptoms pass. And, um, you know, even... I mean, not speaking for me personally, but, you know, I've had patients who, you know, have started on medications. I've got them into, you know, Whitman Walker, so many different programs up here for them to get into. Um, and, you know, they've started on medications and, you know, they have that little first couple of days to weeks of like GI issues. And then, you know, their body adjusts. They start, they, they adjust to the medications and, they start feeling well they start feeling back to normal and you know they, they go about their their daily routines um it's a lot of it's a lot of it's a mixture between actual physical symptoms and mind over matter 
you know, having a positive outlook. I think a lot of it's positive outlook. You know, if if you sit there and think you're going to be sick and, you know, you, you fall into that depression, you know, mental health is always something very important with HIV. That goes with HIV as well, because, you know, if you're not mentally prepared to do this and you're not mentally in the right mind space, it's going to consume you. Yes, definitely. Definitely so. Um, and and there is always going to be some resource. So and I'm speaking to anybody watching this. Um, there will always be resources somewhere available for you if you need those extra helps. Um, they're not always the easiest to access. Um, but if you ever have questions or you need help finding those people or those places, um, those resources, all you have to do is shoot me a message. You can shoot or, me a message. Uh, Definitely shoot me Great. a message. <laughs> I'm all about uh, you know people reaching out. Like I'm, I'm all about awareness and, and health and like making sure that the stigma doesn't take over. And like I'm all about helping people, and I've helped so many other people yeah. like outside of my patient load. You know, people call me all the time. And it's totally confidential. Yeah, it's you know uh, me, me and Jason have collaborated on things. You know, mm -hmm. and we're totally confidential about it. We're we're professional in no sense. Yes, and even and, and I always say too, like if uh, you know if if you know that I do this for a living and you reach out to me, it's not my professional role, but I consider it a professional role. I care about you personally, but I will be professional. And I I say that Chris and I absolutely have. I've hit him up and been like, hey. I need to know a resource for this person who's going through this situation. And I'd be like, oh, here's a whole bunch of resources. Oh, oh, give me a second. Let me get into it. I mean, I think we've worked together with people like out of, out of states for both oh, you yeah. and for me. And, you know, sometimes it's just about knowing who to know. You know, like I may not always have the answers, but I know people that I can call. And Chris is one of them. Um, so definitely, definitely, definitely count us as resources. And Todd says here, contact the Cherry Fund or shoot me a message. I know lots of people in this community. Um, so if you ever need anything, make sure that you uh, scroll through these comments and you'll find some good resources. Uh, but we will always be there to help. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And uh, so what does, um, I always tell people one of the, one of my favorite things, um, I was at, a, at an HIV talk one day. Um, and there was a man who came in who was diagnosed um, in like the mid 80s with HIV. And he came in and he said, um, you know, he, he basically shared his journey. And he pulled out a clear box full of pills. And I mean, there were probably like 30 pills in there. And he said, how long do you think this would last me? And everybody was like, a month. And they'd be like, two weeks. <laughs> you know, they, and he was like, this is what I had to take every single day. No. And it was just insane, the number of pills. I, and I think he actually said it was like 19 pills per 24 hours or something like that. Um, and it's, it's crazy to think that we were, we, we were that far. I wouldn't, I won't say that far behind. That was what the standard was. And you were talking about your medications. Todd was talking about his medications. Now we're down to the point where you can take, in some cases, one pill. No medication. Um, and a lot of people that I know are taking one pill once a day. So they'll get up in the morning and they'll take their pill. And, and that's that. Um, one thing I always like to highlight, though, you can't necessarily make that decision on your own. No. So, um, like you were talking about, you still go in for your appointments regularly Absolutely. to make sure that things, are still, things are still where you want them to be. Um, so I always like to point out, you know, while we are in charge of our own health and while we can, you know, kind of make that final call, it's really, really important that we reach out to those resources or those providers and just kind of get a better picture of what's going on. Um, and when, when someone you know, works with me and they just tested positive. The process is rather simple. We, we say the same thing that, you know, Chris was told in the, the testing van. Um, 
okay, so this preliminary test is positive. You need to go get another test to look a little closer and see what's going on. And so then what we do is we look and see what's the viral load. So how much of the virus is in your body? What's your CD4 count, which is basically how strong is your immune system? You know, how are they working against each other and with each other? And how can we help that to make you healthy? So it's really, really important um, to remember that, you know, when you first hear that news, a lot of information is gonna get thrown at you. A lot of emotions are gonna be coming through you. Um, rely and trust the resources to make sure that you can be as healthy as possible because you certainly can do it. And also, um, sorry. Um, no, please. Um, just a suggestion on my behalf, um, like Jason yeah. said, there's a lot of information that, that's going to be thrown at you when you first go. Um, if you have a friend, even if it's just one person, you know, even if you only have one person in the whole world that you can trust, bring that friend um, because you're probably so overwhelmed that you're not going to, you're going to hear every third word, every fourth word. Yeah. You're going to be looking at the pills on the walls. You're going to be reading the literature on the walls. You're going to be so overwhelmed, but your friend will most likely be there and be able to pick up on everything because they want to be there and help you. So they'll be able to take better yeah. notes on things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you know, I always, I always say the same thing. You don't have to walk out of that clinic room or that testing room and tell the entire world right then because you deserve time to process and you need time to process and get your feet steady. Um, but there's something really important about having, having that, um, that immediate support and that second set of ears, that second head. You know, we always say two heads are better than one. I don't always agree with that. In this case, though, We'll go with it. Yeah. Um, don't even go there, Chris. I'm not. Uh, oh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, and uh, and I, I think that that's super important. Um, Todd also agrees. So that's good advice, Chris. And uh, Leanne popped in to say, I'm so proud of you guys for doing this. So many people out there still aren't educated on living with HIV or AIDS. This is so helpful to other people who don't understand what it's all about. Love you both. Mm -hmm. Leanne, we, we both, well, I will speak for me. I can't speak for I this. love you, Leanne. Uh, but I love you. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, Nina, uh, talking about her son, he was in the Ryan White Foundation that helped pay for his meds, medical bills, and other things. Um, and that addresses a really, really important um, point that we can always find you funding. Yeah. We can always money um like i said the first question is how long do i have to live second question and the second question is how do i pay for it we will find you money um there's there's you know, so much there's so many programs out there for people who like you don't make a lot of income don't make a high enough income or anything like you you will have the help that you need you know and yeah. you will no matter what income range you're in you'll have the help that you need um uh, a lot of the medications themselves give out like coupon cards, like for the insurances that like, like take the bulk of the price off anyway. You know, there, there's a lot of different things. And both Jason and I are well educated on them for our patients. So, you know, if you need that, let us know. Yeah, totally so. And, and I think that's one of the most surprising things when people do test positive um, is that oh my gosh, there are all of these programs and all of these funding streams that I had no idea existed. Um, when I found out that Virginia, you know, 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, when I found out that Virginia had a program that made sure that every person that tested positive for HIV had access to medicine, I was like, seriously, really? And we do. And, and so many places have this funding set aside to make sure that you are healthy and to help you. Um, and if you ever, ever need help, just reach out because it is here. Absolutely. So um, let's see here. I'm, I'm looking through to see what other questions we have. Um, if anybody does have any questions for Chris before we let him go for his evening. Um, 
just comment in, in the comment section and we'll, we'll read that over. Uh, Sasha says, such a blessing to someone. Uh, Michael the Masters has joined us. Hi, Michael. Thanks for being Hi, here tonight. Um, Gabby and Carlos both are here. Hi, y'all. Thank you for being here. I'm back, to, back at you, Gabby. Uh, let's see. Todd, let's see. No, you do not. Um, I don't know if you ever need to do that ever, but be honest with all the ones you can be and never be ashamed. Yeah, that's a really, really, really important thing is you don't have to be ashamed. There is going now I'm not gonna sit here and say, don't be ashamed, you're feeling ashamed, don't feel that way. Look, you have every right to feel any way that you want. But I'm telling you from someone on the outside of this situation, you don't have to feel ashamed if you get that that plus side. And I've heard so many people say, for making it a plus sign, or making it positive, I sure feel negative. And I say, you know what? That's okay. It's all right to feel negative. But like Chris was saying earlier, you're going to process it, and then you're going to realize that you've got a life to live, and you have a purpose on this planet. And it may take you a little while to figure out what that purpose is. It may take you a little while to get back on your feet. Um, but we're, we're here. There are people. You may not know me. You may not know Chris. But there are people in this world right now who care about you and are supporting you even though you don't even know it. That's why we do what we do. That's why we have conversations like this. Because you're not alone. I don't. Uh, absolutely. And something, uh, something I like to tell my patients is when they first get diagnosed by the doctor, the doctor will usually call me in afterwards to like talk to them. Um, because I can relate. And, you know, when you first get your diagnosis from the doctor, you know, the doctor, you're thinking, what do you know? How can you relate to this? You know, so it, they use me a lot as a tool to help people with their the transition. Um, so I'll, I'll go and I'll, and I'll talk to them. And I'll, the first thing I do is give them a hug. You know, let them ask them, is it okay to give them a hug? You know, give them a hug. And then, you know, let them know that this is the first day of the rest of your life. Yeah. And you have a choice now. Do you want to live in it or do you want to just exist? And if you want to live, I'm here to help you. And, you know, I let them know, you know, let's go through the steps. I, I, I've taken my patients from there to their first appointment on my days off. I've taken the, driven them to their first appointment, made sure they got their prescriptions, make sure that they, it's like raising a child, make sure they get their little training wheels. Once they got everything <laughs> to go, you're good to go. Yeah. And never and be ashamed of anything. Like, don't be ashamed of it. Definitely. Not. Um, and on on that, while you're talking about going the extra mile and helping people, um, I want to point out that Jeffrey Leg is currently watching, um, and Jeffrey is actually chock full of information about the V program. Um, it's a ten to fourteen day process where basically they help bridge you from un unmedicated um, and not having access to the point where you do have access to medication. Um, so that's another really great program. And just pointing out all of your providers um, will know this information or at least should know of someone who does. So another, another good reason to go to that provider is they can get your referrals into these programs. What I wanted to say though about Jeffrey is his next comment. Um, Jeffrey says, Chris, you are amazing and very helpful. You did a great job stepping me through my own process. And I absolutely love you for that. Um, I love Jeffrey. Hey, Jeffrey. <laughs> so it really does matter. Um, I think that's really what, what it comes down to is mattering. Um, I know for me on my side, and I've talked about this before, and I actually have another young lady who wants to talk about her work in the HIV field, um, who also lost her mom to HIV. Um, she was just talking to me today and we're trying to get it nailed down. One of the hardest things that I deal with as a tester, as an educator, as an activist, is when people say exactly what you just said, Chris, like you have no idea what I'm going through. After doing this for 10 years almost, I still can't tell you what it feels like to hear the words you're positive. Um, I can, I can imagine it because there was a point 
when I started in my career, I started because I thought those words were about to come out of someone's mouth. I had every symptom. I had, you know, all the risky behaviors. I had everything. I, I had what I thought was going to be a positive test, but I did not test positive. And for me as an activist and for me as a tester and an educator, one thing that I often struggle with, um, a little less now than before, <laughs> is saying, can I really make the impact? Because I'm negative. I don't have HIV, so I can't convey exactly, you know, what I want to convey to someone in that position. But I think the take home from this is I'm, I'm reminded by hearing you talk and I'm reminded by seeing these comments that yes, I matter with what I'm doing as an HIV negative person who is trying to be that ally and that support and that resource person, I matter. At the same point that we are saying, Chris, you matter because you're telling your story and you know we're watching and, and you are totally making a difference and yes, your story, your journey matters and to wrap that up, this whole daggone thing matters because we've got people now sitting here on this saying, I love someone who had HIV. I am someone who has HIV. I know someone who has HIV. What can I do to help someone? Um, it matters. Every little thing that we can do to support our, our community. And when I say our community, I don't just mean the people that look like us or the people that sleep with the same people as us, or the people who live in the same place as us. It's the people who care the same way that we care. Um, so that's that's kind of my, I don't know why I just went on that whole tangent. It's, I just it's, it. a, it's important for people to know that. Like it, it, it's important. It, and a, a lot of people who just get diagnosed don't realize that people who aren't HIV positive want to help, and they just don't know how to. You, you, Jason, are, are lucky enough to be someone who knows how to help. And, you know, like, you do so much work for the community and the, and the HIV community and everyone. Like, you should be applauded for the, all the work you do. You're amazing. Um, especially since, like, you don't have it. So you, don't, you could have easily just said, oh, whatever, I don't, I, don't, I don't have to do this. This doesn't relate to me, you know. I do it because it relates to me. It's in my medical field. I, I love the medical field. I love helping people, you know, and this hits home for so many, on so many levels. And, you know, I love what I do. And, you know, we, you know, you do amazing work. I try to do the, as much work as possible with the community and, you know, all we can do, and you don't have to be HIV positive to be an ally or an activist um, for people out there. If you want to be an activist, you know, contact Jason, contact your local, you know, HIV resource center, they can help you. Absolutely. And we, we can't have enough people in the world that care. Um, and I'm going to swing around real quick. Um, so just a couple of these comments, Karen Nash, who is also a great activist in the area, um, is here. Um, Neek McDowell says, love you, Chris. Thank you for being brave and sharing your story. I think you are the same you, smart mouth and all. So amazing. She's actually one of my classmates on my first day of school. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so she, we went to school together. So, yeah. That's not... All right. So so what you're saying is credible witness. Credible witness. <laughs> um, Keith says, this has been uh, so learning, uh, So gr I'm assuming so great, learning from you both. Uh, you both are amazing for what you do. Jeffrey said, uh, love you guys. And um, this makes me super happy. So Nina, um, the mother of Gigi, AJ, says it's hard to hear it at first from a parent's point of view, but I had to support him through every step of his journey. I'm not sure how I can help other parents with this, but I'd like to help somehow. So to that point, I will say, we can make it happen. Exactly. If you want to help other parents, let's do it. Um, and I will tell you just from like a, a brainstorming point of view, get in touch with an organization. I, I think often of organizations like PFLAG, you know, parents um, for lesbian and gays. Uh, finding an organization like that 
and then going and telling your story as a mom, as a dad, as a guardian, as a grandparent, if you are watching this and you know that you've loved someone and like you said, from a parent's point of view, you had this reaction, share that story. Because one of the conversations I had to have with my mom was how I was not going to automatically get AIDS and die because I was gay. And that was a fear that was rooted in her because of her upbringing. And we had to grow together because because of that, I was afraid just because I'm this way, am I gonna get this? And so it's so important that parents talk to, to each other. Um, and so Nina, do it, do it, do it. If you feel that strongly about it, don't stop. Every voice that is used, every experience that is shared, every story that is told, is breaking down stigma every single minute. It's breaking down all of this ignorance. It's sharing the support, and that's what we need. So, Nina, don't let anybody stop you. Go tell your story. And if you don't know where to say it, then get your little cell phone out, record a little video, post it up on Facebook, sure. and let the world get that exactly. way. That's exactly what we're doing here tonight. And, and I could not be happier that she wants to do that. And I'm going to say thank you again, Chris for telling your story tonight. Thank you. Um, I'm super, super excited to have had you. Um, I know I kept you a little bit longer than I told you I would. Oh, you're so fine. I'm, you're I'm fine. fine. Uh, sorry. Um, but um, I, I will say real quick um, that if anybody has any last question or last thing to say to Chris, now is your time to do it. Um, Valerie, thank you for being here. Wild, thanks for being here. Shannon is uh, coming in. Nina says, Chris, you can get up uh, you can get up with me anything. KK has my cell phone number. Okay. Uh, so you can get up with her and let, let's make this happen. Uh, Karen says, this is what it's all about, breaking down stigmas. Um, so I think that we have done, I feel, I know, I believe that we have done a lot tonight to at least shed a little bit of light on what it is like to go through this process. And and I, I think that that's what it takes. So I hope that this hour that we spent with Chris will inspire everyone watching this to take time and have a conversation. If you say, I just need to ask them questions, ask your questions. If you have concerns, share your concerns. If you realize now that maybe now's a good time for you to get tested and you feel inspired to do that, Hit us up. Let's make it happen. If you haven't been to a doctor's appointment in a little while, let's find you a doctor and get some blood work done and make sure exactly. you're as healthy as a horse. Let's do it. We're doing it together, and that's what this is about. Yep. So with that, I always put you on the spot, and I say to close out the show, because I've, I've got my own little thing to close it out, I always like to know if you had, let's see, you're a pageant girl. So if, if you had 30 seconds or less to share one piece of advice to keep the world spinning until next week, when we come back for next week's episode, what would your one piece of advice to keep the world spinning be for people watching right now? It's actually a simple little phrase that um, one, of the, one of my drag idols used to say all the time, Erica Andrews, um, she, and I, I go by it every day. It's practice love, not labels. Um, and it just means, you know, regardless of what, what, who you, someone is, the color of their skin, their status, anything, just practice love. Life is too, life is too short to do anything but that. Love life, love each other, and just have a great life. That's it. That was beautiful. That <laughs> <laughs> like, when question and answer. It's like, you know what, with that answer, you win the category, and I think you have snatched the crown. Yeah. <laughs> so that is yours. I love it. I love it, love it, love it. It's all about the love, not the labels. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to leave you with a little mantra of my own, and um, it goes something like this. So it says, from dreams to goals and goals to reality, because dreams are for those who are sleeping, 
if you are alive and awake watching the Jason Elliott show, learning about HIV, that means you're alive and awake enough to actually set goals and then work towards them. Goals are attainable. It might take a whole lot of time and a whole lot of hard work. But after you put some time and effort into it, those goals suddenly become your reality. Your reality is yours and yours alone. There's nobody else in this entire world that can make your reality for you. But more importantly, that means there's nobody in this entire world that can stop you from making that reality for yourself. So dream big and then work hard so you can bask in the reality that you've created for yourself. And of course, come back every single week and tell us about it on the Jason Elliott Show, because <laughs> that's what we do around here. <laughs> we share our stories, we encourage each other, and we learn a little bit along the way. And tonight, I hope that you all have learned a lot from the wonderful, the beautiful, this is so special to me, Chris, all the way from Washington, D.C., who has shared his journey about um, living an empowered life and loving, not labeling, uh, so, Chris, thank you again for being here, oh. and thank all of you for watching tonight. I encourage you to share this video with the people you think need to hear it the most, uh, and use your own voice to share your own story until we can meet again. So, that is that. Thank you for sharing uh, your journey during STI Awareness Month, and the hardest part of this whole show is getting our hands lined up, because you have to give me a high five through the video. Oh, my hands but huge. But your hands are much bigger. So oh, I'm going to get away. Gotcha. Oh, then I'll get over here. Okay. Better work. Bam. We got it. Better work. That's good. <laughs> you're, you're happy here. That's okay. All right. Thank you for being here. No, thank you. Uh, we will talk soon, and I will see all the rest of you next week Bye. at 7 p.m. Eastern your time. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Have a great night. Did we get off? No, I think I can. Ah. <laughs> there we go have a great night a wonderful weekend a fantastic week and i'll see you next week remember to do something good Mwah.